Welcome to Live Doff, your online Doff Yomi Shear. Shalom, welcome to today's Daf Yomi. Nida Daf Mem Gimel Amar Aleph. We will begin from the first line. Amar Ish Lakish. Kana, if there's a rod bekumta is shalzav in the fold of his zav, for instance, his armpit, the hisid bayas hatar. If a zav, a person who had reias ziva and his tame, and he had this rod inside his fold, and he pushed and he moved a person who is Tahir, the person nevertheless remains Tahir. Kana bekumte shal tahir. however in the reverse, if the Kana is in the Kaimit, in the fold of a Tahir person, v'hisad bayis hazav, and he went ahead and moved the Zav, Tameh then he becomes Tameh. Now we know that a Kaimit, a concealed area in a person, is considered base hastarim, and base hastarim is never metame b'maga. If it comes into contact with a Dabar Tameh or a Dabar Tameh, is coming into contact with a Dover Toher. If it happens via a concealed area, it does not transmit Tuma. But that is strictly re- regarding Tumas Maga. However, regarding Tumas Smasa, carrying the Dover Tame, sometimes the Tuma is Matame when you carry it. In that case, there is no differentiation between a revealed area, an exposed area of the person, and a concealed area. Because nevertheless, he carried the, the Tuma. So we understand why in the second case the person is becoming tummy because he moved the zav, he carried the zav, and that is called Tumas Heset. Regardless of the fact that the rod was positioned in his base astorum, he nevertheless is being tummy because of the masa, because of the Heset, because he moved or carried the zav. However, what we still uh, are wondering is why in the first case is the, a person remaining to her if the, the zav went ahead and used a rod in his kaimit to push, to move a, dover, a person who is tar. Why would the person remain tar? It's not Tumas Maga, it is Tumas Hesed that we're discussing here. So the Gemara continues, My time, what is the reason for the first halacha that the person who was moved by a Zav remains to her? The Amakra says in the passage, Anything that the person, any person that was touched by a Zav, Yadav Lashatav Amayim, his hands weren't washed in water, he will become Tami. Rashi explains this is not referring to referring to ordinary uh, Tumas Maga where a uh, Zav comes into contact, direct contact with a Toher. That we learn from a different Pasuk. This Pasuk is coming to include Tumas Heset, where the Zav moves or lifts another person, which is a Tuma which is exclusive to Zav. We never find a similar concept anywhere else that a Dover Tame, an impure thing, will go ahead and be metame something else by lifting the Dover to her. It's exclusive to Zav. Zehu Heseite Shal Zav. This is a halacha called Heset of Zav, where the Zav went ahead and moved um, another object. We never find this halacha anywhere else. This is exclusive, special halacha by Zav. Va'afki Rachmana Balasha Negiyah. Now, the Torah uses the words which is, which sounds like there is a negia, there is a contact, and in reality we're speaking about hesed, just merely moving something. The Pasuk concludes, he didn't wash his hands. Why do we mention the words yadav? Why is yadav so important here? The answer is that we're coming to teach, the Torah is coming to teach us something. We have to comply with the concept of yadav. Yadav is something external, is something revealed. The only way a tumor gets transmitted from a Zav to a Tahir is via a, an external area in the guf, something revealed like Yadav. So therefore here the Torah is teaching us that the tuma coming from a Zav, although it is not Tumas Maga, it is rather Tumas Hesed that he is moving something which is similar to Tumas Masa as if he's lifting it. So that's not a direct contact tuma. However, the concept of Yadav of that it's, that we require it be transmitted via an, a, an external part of the guf, a revealed part of the guf like yodaim, will apply even in the halacha of hesed. Now why then did the Torah coin the term yigaboy when we're speaking about hesed? What is it? What is it? Um, why, why is it connected to Nagia when we're not even speaking about Nagia? The answer is there is a connection. Lemeir to teach us the Heset or Nagia Kiyadav. The Torah is actually teaching us an additional halacha. Heset Hazav will only happen through a revealed era, not a base Astorim. As well, anywhere else, 
in the whole Torah when there is Tumas Maga, when we're discussing Tumas that come via contact, it is also strictly if it happened with a revealed external part of the guf and not a base astar. Again, to teach us, lememra, to teach us the heset, that just like the Tumas heset coming from Azav needs to be via a revealed area, an external limb, like Yodayim, so to Unagiyah, same thing will apply whenever we have Tumas Maga anywhere else in the Torah, Ki Yadav, they are both compared to Yodayim. Ma Hasam Me'avroi, just like a hand is external, Av Hacham Me'avroi, here too, it needs to be external. So in conclusion, there is Halacha called Beis Hastarim, a, p- a part of the person that is concealed. There is no Tumas Maga applied in that um, event, because there is no revealed connection. Apparently the usual way of handling something is by a revealed part of the guf, a hand, a foot, a part that's external. However, something that's inside the guf in a concealed area cannot handle properly. It is not meant to come into contact with external objects. The terror is mamayit, excludes that from Tumas Maga. However, regarding Tumas Masa, if a person will carry a Dabar Tamay within a concealed area, of course, Tumas Masa will apply, he will receive Tuma from that Dabar Tamay. There is one exception to that, which is Tumas Zav. When a Zav moves or carries a Dabar Tahir, and he is doing it through a base Astorim, his own base Astorim. For instance, the case of the rod, which is positioned inside his base Astorim, and he uses that to be mace to move a Dabar Tahir. The Torah is Mimayit, that from Tuma, and the person remains Tahir. Okay, let's see the next Shtikl Gemara. The Gemara is referring to the Halacha mentioned in the Mishnah where there is a difference between the Re'iyah of an Isha, where their dam is not required to actually leave her guf in order for her to become Tamei. It is different than the Re'iyah of an Ish, where the Tuma must actually exit the guf in order for him to become Tamei. How do we know that? Avala Zavol Balkeri Einen Metamin the ending of the statement, Ashatei say to Masan Lachutz, until the Tumah actually leaves the Guf. How do we know that? Zav, Tichsiv Kiyya Zav Mibsarei, until the Zav is a Zav Mibsarei, and we darshan Ashatei say Zoyvai Mibsarei, until the Ziva actually leaves his Guf, he will not be Tamei. Balkeri, how do we know the same Allah applies to a Balkeri? Tichsiv Viish Kisei Tse Mimenu Sheikh Vazera, until the Zara actually leaves the person. Only then does he become tummy. This is referring to the case described in the Mishnah, where a person had actually felt a sensation, a trembling throughout his guf, and apparently the wazera dislodged from the source. He may nevertheless still continue eating truma if he does something to prevent the zera from leaving his guf. Until then, he is still considered tar and may complete the achilas truma. What does he do? He grasps the aver and thereby prevents Zerah from leaving. So, how is he allowed to grasp the Aver? Why are we not concerned with this act uh, creating uh, some sort of sensation which might arouse him to emit more Zerah and that would be considered Zerah Levatala, of course. Vatanya, haven't we learned in the Bright Sir Blazo Eimer, Kaloiches a person who grasps his Aver, Umashtin, he passes water, Ki'ilu, it is considered as if Maybe Mabul Oilam. We know that the people at the Dura Amabul, this was their chet, that they were being moitzi, their zera levatala, they were emitting their seed for waste. And when a person goes ahead and um, comes into contact, direct contact with his aver, this may cause a sensation which may lead to zera levatala. So, how is he allowed to go grasp his Amar Abayi? We're speaking about the matlas ava, he's doing it with a thick cloth with, which doesn't generate any sensation and there's no shash of Zara Levatala. Rava Amar, I feel the time, even if you'll say the matlas raka we're speaking about a thin cloth, we are still not concerned. Kivan the Akar Akar. Because we're speaking about a case where a person had already experienced the dislodging of Zara from the source. He had trembled throughout his body. So there was already a an Akira, there was already a dislodging of the Zara. And therefore there was no khashash that the handling of the Ama will bring about an additional Haitzas Zera. In fact, the Gemara, is that so? We're afraid that perhaps this will cause an additional Zera to be generated and leave the Guf, and therefore 
there still is a hashash, a concern for Haitzar Zara. In fact, the Gemara of Rava lo Sufi lo Chayish, Rava doesn't um, is not concerned that this will cause more Zara to be emitted. Vatani we've learned in a brayso lemaza doyma. To what is this compared? Meaning handling the Aver Hazacha, what does it compare to? Lenoisein Edzba Bain. To a person who inserts his, his finger into his eye, she calls man she etzba ba'ayin. As, as long as the etzba, as the finger remains in his eye, midamas, it will cause tearing. V'chayzeris midamas, and will bring about more tearing. Meaning it's not just a one-time event, it is a constant process that keeps on going. And therefore here too, when one would handle his aver, even if it's already after an akira zera, there was already a trembling, a sensation of dislodging of zera that took place, Nevertheless, this can bring about an additional Hitzar Zara. So why are we not concerned with that? And why is he allowed to be Eiches, his Amo, with a matlis, with a thin cloth, according to Rava? And for the Gemara, the Rava holds Kol Echamumi, V'hadar Echamumi B'Shaitei, to get aroused and re-aroused at the same moment when the initial arousal was a very powerful one, it was a strong Akira. Yeah, if it's just a minor arousal, yes, it can keep on going and keep on adding. But in this case of the Mishnah, we're discussing the person who had a trembling feeling throughout his goof. So apparently there was a very powerful, his iris, a very powerful Akira, and that only happens once and not quickly so soon after. Again, Virava kol achamumi to arouse v'hader achamumi to get another chimum b'shaiti at the same point in time loish chiyach is not common. We are not chayshin. We are not concerned with that. So let's make a quick summary. We had a lach in the Mishnah where a person felt a sensation, a very strong, powerful sensation which reverberated through his whole guf. He felt the zera being dislodged, and he is in the middle of eating truma. He's allowed to prevent it from emitting his, uh, from exiting his guf by grasping his aver hazocher. The Gemara questioned, how is that possible? Doesn't it bring about a michshol and avera of Yitzhar Zera? We have two solutions. Abayiz, Teretz, that is using a thick cloth. Rav's proposal that, even with a thin cloth, there is no chashash, provided that there was a very powerful akira. And therefore, that only happens one time and will not happen so quickly soon after. And therefore, we are not chashish, in this case, for Yitzhar Zera Latali, even if he's handling his aver with a matlis raka, with a thin cloth. Continuing on the same topic, says Shmuel like this, Any time there is Zera, which is not powerful enough, it doesn't have the ability to germinate to be Mazria, that is not considered Zera in the context of being Metame. We know that a Balkari, one who sees Zera, or in fact anybody who comes into contact with Zera, there is Tuma there, but that is strictly Zera which is capable of being Mazria, of capable of being Moilid. So we, we're equating the Tuma of the Zera with the power of being Mazria. So Shmuel maintains that a Zera which was emitted without a complete comprehensive sensation of the Guf does not have the power to germinate and to be Moilid and therefore does not have a Din of Tuma. My Taima, Sheikh Zera Amrachmana. The Torah uses the concept, the word of Zer, Sheikh Vazera, Beru'il Azriya, needs to be Roy, fit to be Mazriya. Mace, maybe we've learned in a bright, so Yemahar Baladi, he had um, impure thoughts at night. Va'amad, Va'umatsab, sorry, Cham, he woke up and he found his Aver, Cham, uh, it was heated up, and there was a Chashash, perhaps, that there was a Kerry. Tommy, he's Tommy. So we see from here, although there was no Hargoshas, Kal Haguf, he didn't feel. Uh, any major sensation, otherwise he would have awoken. And nevertheless, the Brysa says that he is Tommy. How is that possible according to Shmuel? Tirgum Rafuna uh, interpreted the Brysa, he had relation, he had Tashmish in his dream, so there was already Haitzar Zera, and evidently there was also Hargashas Kalagov. We presume that if there was Haitzar Zera, then certainly there was a sensation of dislodging of the Zera as well, and therefore the Zera is considered Ro'i Lahazriya, it is full-fledged Zera, and therefore Metame. Again, Tirgum Rafuna B'Meshamesh Metasa B'Chalayim D'Yi Efshar, it is impossible L'Shamesh B'Loi Hargosha to do that without having a proper sensation. So the first Lashon of Shmuel maintains that in order for Zera to be Metame, it needs to be Ro'i Lahazriya, which means it needs to be as a result of a complete, comprehensive, full goof sensation.
Dr. Marvaita, Lishna Chrina Amar Shmuel, there is a second version in the name of Shmuel. Kol Shech Vazera Sheina Yorke Chetz, Eina Metama. Certainly, in order for Zera to be Metame, it needs to be Roy Lahazria. But what is considered Roy Lahazria? What is required? So, there are two phases in emitting Zera. There is the initial sensation of dislodging of the Zera from its source. That is the Akiras Haguf that Shmuel mentioned earlier. In addition, there is the actual emission of the Zera, which comes which comes in a fashion of a shooting arrow and that is the second phase of the completion of the zera and it, uh, the 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 yerakhets actually um, completes the power it 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 inserts a power of imazrei into the into the zera and according to the second lashon of shmuel that that too is required to be matame because only then Will it be Roy Lahazra? You need phase A, which is the Akira's Haguf mentioned in the first version of Shmuel. And in addition, you need the f- second phase as well, which is the halacha of Yoyure Kechetz. It needs to shoot as an, as an arrow. My Ikabain Hai Lishna Lahai Lishna. What is the difference between both versions of Shmuel? Ikabain Hai, there is a difference. Nekr Bahagasha. If it was dislodged with a sensation, for Yatsa Shalai Bahagasha, but it left the Guf without a sensation. He didn't experience the Yoyure Kechetz. So therefore, according to the second Lashon of Shmuel, that does not constitute a proper Zerah and will not be Matami. However, according to the first Lashon of Shmuel, the Akira's Haguf, the initial dislodging of the Guf, of the Zerah from the Guf with a uh, Hargasha, with a sensation, is sufficient to deem it Roy Lazria and will be Matami. Zakhtim Marvaita, Milsa de Pshita Lili Shmuel, this halacha, which is Pashat, which is obvious, for Shmuel, without any doubt, me boy lili rava. Rava had a shayla regarding that specific halacha. The boy rava. Rava asked the question. Nekro bahagosha. Suppose Zara was dislodged with a sensation. However, when it left the guf, it was devoid of a sensation. It did not have the condition of yoyre kechetz. Ma, what is the halacha? Is this considered roi lazria and will be matama or not? Toshma baal keri. Let's come in here. Baal keri shetaval. It says in the Mishnah that a Balkari who had an emission of Zerah and he was tummy, then he went to the mikveh, he didn't pass water beforehand. After the Tvila, he will pass water and he will become tummy again. Why? Because we are concerned that perhaps some Zerah had remained inside the Guf. And that Zerah by coming out now after Tvila will be Matami the person all over again. Balkari Shatava Mayim, he went to the mikveh without passing water. Kshiyat al when he'll be mat al afterwards tummy, he'll become tummy. So we see from here, this zera that's coming out now is without Yerika Chetz. There's no sensation of Yerika Chetz going on now. But simply because it had originated with the Hargoshas Akira, with the initial dislodging of the guf, that happened with a proper Hargosha that is sufficient to consider it Roy Lazriel be Matami. So here we have a proof of Raya to the first Lashon of Shmuel, that Akira's Hargasha is enough. And for the Gemara, Shan Yasin, there is different, the Ruba Bahargasha Nafak. Since most of the Zera exited the Guf with a proper Hargasha of Yerik Echetz, it was a powerful emission of Zera. So although this little bit, a miut, this, this Mashu of Zera which remained in the Guf, did not leave with a Hargasha, but the Hargasha, the sensation of Yerik Echetz, which was applied to the rest of the Zerah, encompasses all the Zerah found at that moment and deems it Roy Lahazria and therefore will be Metame. So that is an exception to the rule. Although there was no actual Yerik Echetz taking place on this specific Zerah, nevertheless it is still considered Roy Lahazria and will be Metame. So in conclusion we have two Lishanis of Shmuel, whether the, the Zerah the Tuma Zara is dependent on the Hargasha's Akira, the dislodging, or do you need, in addition to that, the second Hargasha of Yoyre Kechetz? According to the first version of Shmuel, the first phase is sufficient. According to the second version of Shmuel, we need both phases. Rabbi had a question regarding that specific uh, halacha, this exact case, and we attempted to bring a raya from the Mishnah, and the Gemara answered that is a special case where there was a Yerik Echetz on most of the Zera and therefore it is not necessary for the Miut to undergo that phase as well. However, you have no Raya from here whether the first Lashon of Shmuel correct or the second Lashon of Shmuel is correct. Perhaps you need both phases together in order to be Metame the Zera. Lishna there's yet a third 
Lashon to Shmuel. Lishon Achrin Amar Lo Amar Shmuel Kol Shichva Zera Sheina Yerik Echetz Eina Mazras. Any zera that it does not shoot as an arrow, doesn't have the experience of Yerik Echetz, will not be germinating. Will not have a kayach of the Mazria. So we make a diak from here. Azrui Hu Deloy Mizra. It implies that certainly to be Mazria, it will not have the power to do that. Hatmuyi Metamya. However, regarding Kabbalah's Tumah, it's unrelated to being able to be Roy Lazria. Even if it doesn't have the ability to be Mazria, it is still Metami. There is no connection between the two things. So this is totally different than the first two versions of Shmuel who equated Tumah with Roy Lazria. Shmuel in the third version holds, even if there was no sensation present whatsoever, there wasn't an Akira Saguf with Haragasha, nor there wasn't there a Yerik Echetz. Nevertheless, the Zerah will be Matamer, even though it is not Roy Lazria. And we learn it from a Pasuk, Shenema Kiyyeh Bochayisha Shaloyi Yatar, if there will be a person who will not be Tar, Mikre, it is through a happening. Afilu Keri Ba'ilam. The extra word Mikre teaches us, even if it was just an occurrence, it wasn't accompanied with any Hargasha whatsoever, nevertheless it can be Matame the person. So in conclusion, let's make a quick summary. What type of Zara is Matame? We have three Lashonis of Shmuel. Either you need a Hargasha's Akira, a sensation during the uprooting of the Zara, and that is sufficient. Or you need phase two as well, which is leaving the Guf through a Yerikechetz. Because both Lashonis of Shmuel, these two first Lashonis hold that there is an comparison between, there is a connection between the being Roy Lahazria and being Matame. The question is just what is required in order for it to be Roy Lahazria. And then we have the final Lashon of Shmuel who maintains that there is no connection whatsoever between Zerah being Matame and Zerah being Roy Lahazria. Even if it is not Roy, it is not fit to germinate at all. There was never any Hargash that took place at all, nowhere in the beginning nor at the end. It still will be we have three questions, three different Iboyas. All three will end up with Teku, unconcluded, and it is related to the previous Gemara. A guy who had impure thoughts, Vyorad, Vitaval, so he had a dislodging of Zerah. Then he decided to become a Yid, and he went and was Teval, but the Zerah is still present in his Guf and will come out eventually. The question is like this A guy does not have. Tumas carry. So when the Zerah was actually uprooted, he had no potential of Tumah. He was not in the parsha of being a Tome of a, a, a Tumas Balkari. But then afterwards, he emitted the Zerah when he was already a Yid. So the question is, what are we going to focus on? Are we going to focus on the Shah Sakura when it was a Slaj and he was a guy and he's tired? Or do we look at the Shah Sa'itsiya? When the Zerah actually left the Guf and he's a Yid. Mahu, what do you say? Imtim Salaima, if you will say earlier, meaning even if you follow the Shita of the first Lashon of Shmuel, that we follow the Akira, Imtim Salaima basa Akira as Linan, we depend on the Akira, Hani Mila, it is only the Chumra, it's only when we're looking at astringency. When we're applying astringency, such as in the first Lashon of Shmuel, since it was a proper Akira, Regardless if there was a Yitzhiya or not with Haragasha, we look at the Akira strictly and we're Matami. So that is a stringency. However, in this case, by focusing on the Akira, we're actually applying a leniency. Because at the time of Akira, he was a guy. Do we do that or do we not do that? Avalacha de la Kula, here by looking at, focusing and depending on the Akira, it will come out as a Kula Layaminan. Perhaps we don't say that. Adilma, perhaps Leishna, it makes no difference. And we always follow the Shas Akira. In this case, he will be Tar Teku. It is unconcluded. By Rava, a similar Shaila. Zava. Shenekru Meimiragleo. A Zava who is Matame Beziva and her Meimiraglaim are also Matame. Suppose there was a beginning of a process of passing water. There was an Akira of the Meimiraglaim. The same thing. Viyar the Vatavla and she went to Mustavel and then afterwards passed the water. Mao. Do we look at the Sha'as Akira when it was neck and she was still a Zava? Or do we look at the Sha'as Yitzia when she was already Tar? In Tim even if you will say, Basar Akira as Linan, you always follow the Sha'as Akira. Hanimila is only Shikha Zerah. That is strictly Halach applied to Shikha Zerah. Why is that different? Because Zerah has the, uh, the, the nature of leaving the Guf without um, being able to stop it. It just leaves. And therefore, since it already got dislodged, it's sort of it's on its way out. It already began its departure. 
and therefore we look at the Akira and it is considered as if it already is starting the process of leaving the guf. However, by Meimi or Aglaim, we perhaps won't apply this concept. That was only strictly said by Sheikh Zera that it cannot be restrained. However, in the case of Meimi or Aglaim, the Mati Nakatla, it's easy to restrain. Loi, therefore, in that case, we will not follow the Shah Sakura. You need actual exiting of the Meimi or Aglaim to be Matame. In this case, since the Yetzia of the Meimi or Aglaim happened, took place when she was already Tahir, we look at the present and she is not a tummy. A Dilma, perhaps Loishna, there's no difference between the two. And in both cases, we look at the Shah Sakura. In this case as well, we will follow the time of the Slaji of the Meimi or Aglaim, which was when she was a Zava and she will become a tummy. Take but you rub another shayla. Over there is Kachavim Zava. She was a Zava, a Goy. And Rashi explains that Chachamim applied a Tumaz Ziva to a Goyisha woman who is a, a, a Goyisha woman, that she has a din of a Zava. In that case, Shineklu Meimir Aglaim, that her Meimir Aglaim were dislodged. V'yorud of a Tavla, and she went and was Tavla Mahu. What will be the din in that case? Intim Tzalayim Abbasar Akira Azlina. And if you follow the first version of Shmuel that we look at the Akira strictly. In this case as well, we will apply the din of Akira even though it's Meimir Aglaim, which can easily be restrained. Meaning, let's say, suppose, we follow the stringency of the previously mentioned Shaila, meaning we conclude that even by Meimir Aglaim we will apply the Halacha of Basar Akira. So here as well we should do the same. Even though you can restrain it, we still focus on the Shas Akira and we consider it as if it already began its departure. Perhaps that's only by a Yisraelis who is Tamei Midairaisa. Her Tuma Ziva is a Deiraisa de Ketuma. Over there it's merely a Tumad Rabban. Perhaps we won't apply this stringency and we will not follow the Shah Zakir, but rather we need to wait until the Meimar Glaim actually leaves the Guf. And that happened, of course, once she was a Yid. And therefore she won't become Tamay. Perhaps there's no difference between the cases. Teku. So in summary, we have three separate Shilas of Rava of Basar Akira Azlinan. Meaning, according to the first version of Shmuel, that we follow the time of this lodging, when is that set? Do we apply it to a guy who had an Akira's Zera and then became a Yid? Do we look at the Shas Akira and we matire him? Or do we look at the Shas Yitzia and now he's a Yid and he becomes Tamei? Or perhaps, in this case, since the Shas Akira generates a Kula leniency, we will not apply that concept here. The second Shaila was a Yisraelis Zava who had an Akira of Memir Aglaim and then she was Taival. Do we look at the Shas Akira and she is Tamei since the Memir Aglaim was dislodged when she was a Zava? Or perhaps you don't apply this concept to passing water since it can be restrained and therefore the Akira is not considered as if it already began to depart the Guf, different than by Zera. The third Shiloh, the final Shiloh, was by a Goita, who has the din of a Zava. What's going to happen in that case when there was an Akira of Meimir Aglaim? Do we apply this Halacha to a, a guy as well, since her Tumah is only merely Midr Abanam? Or do we say there as well, since there was an Akira when she was a guy? So of course, the Meimir Aglaim is Matame, and will carry it to the Tumah Dira Abanam. Teku. We leave it unresolved. Going back to the Mishnah, that any of these aforementioned Tumas need the carry Zoiv, need only a minute amount to be Matame, the person who discharges them. Omar Shmuel, no. Zov You need to have enough Ziva to block up the opening of the Aver. It is not enough to have a mashu, you need to have a shir khasimas piyama shanema oy hechtim besoroi mizoivai. If the zoiv actually blocked, clogged up the basar. the Gemara, the mission says otherwise. Vanan tanan, we've learned in the mission of Matam Bechoshen. Even a minute amount. And for the Gemara, who the Amr Kerab Nasan, Shmuel is following the sheet of Rab Nasan, who maintains that a mashu is not sufficient, and you need more than that, you need a shear of blocking up the opening of the Amr. 
תסניה רב נוסן, אם משום רבי שמואל זוב צורך כחסי מאס פי עמו ולא יהוי דלוי, and the Chachamim did not agree with that, and that is the shita of the Chachamim in the Mishnah, that even a mashu of zoiv is sufficient to be matami. My time with Rabbi Shmuel. Now the Gemara is going to discuss the reasoning behind these two shitas. What is the reason for Rabbi Shmuel's halacha? The Amakro Ayhechtem Besaroi Mizoivai. The Pasuk we just mentioned, that you need the zoiv to actually clog up the aver, and that is the shia required to be matami. Rabbanon, what did the Rabbanon do with that Pasuk of Hichtim? If they say that is enough to have a Mashu, so what is Hichtim coming to teach us? Ha'hu mi boileid is coming to teach us Lach metame ve'enoi metame yavish. That ziva will only be metame if it is moist. That is a lashon of Hichtim. It is running. It is something which can clog up. It is moist. And only then does it carry with it Tumas ziva. Rabbi Shmuel, how does Shmuel know this halacha? Ahu, this halacha will be derived from the word mi rar nafka. The pasuk says of zoyis tia tumase be zoyve rar. It runs. It is moist. It is liquid. And therefore, only if it's lach and not yavish. V'rabbanan, what did Rabbanan do with that pasuk? Ahu leminyano dasa. That is coming to teach us the amount of times that a zav is required to see ziva for him to become tummy. A little introduction is in place here. A zav who sees twice is Tome and a very stringent tuma of Mishka of Moshev, anything that he sits on or lies on becomes Tome. However, he is not required to be a carbon until he sees three consecutive days. Three times is Matame the Zav um, to the point that he needs to bring a carbon. Now, even if he sees it um, three times in one day, it doesn't need to be uh, spread out in, in, you know, according to the sequence of days. Three times of Riyah by Yazav will be matami him to the point that he needs to bring a carbon. So the Pasuk of Rar is teaching us the amount of times that he is needed to, to be a Zav. How is that? The Pasuk says, Vizoist, I'm quoting from the uh, Pasuk, Vizoist here to Masa Bezoivai. Once, Bezoivai is implying one Riyah. Rar Besarai, meaning he had another Riyah. As Zoivai, he had a third Re'iya. So the Pasuk is teaching us that there needs to be three Re'iyas to be Matamehim on the highest level of Ziva. Let's see the Gemara inside again. Rabbanon ahu l'minyana da'asa. We need that word's rar to teach us the counting. Zoivai chada. Zoivai is the first time. Rar b'sarai is implying a second Re'iya. As Zoivai, the third and final time, is for the third Re'iya of the Zav which is the highest level of Tumah. Lima dal Zav bal Sholesh Re'iyos. A Zav who had three Re'iyos, Shechai B'Karvan, needs to bring a Karvan. Now there's another part of the Pasuk, which says, Ay hechtim b'sorei mizoivoi tumasahi. This teaches us the lower level of Zav. If a Zav sees twice, he will be a partial Zav. He gets the Tumah, but without the Karvan. Zav to Gemara Vaita, Ay hechtim b'sorei mizoivoi tamei. Miksas zoivoi tamei. So a hechtem b'sari mi zoivi teaches us that he's, if he's only a partial zav, he only sees twice, two out of three, he is nevertheless tamei li me dal zav bal shteri yois. It comes to teach us that a zav who sees two eyes, she metame mishka v'moishav, he's metame something which he sits or lies on, and mishka is something which he lies on, moishav is something which he sits on, and that is a full-fledged zav, except that he doesn't need to bring a carbon. Rabbi Shmuel Minyana Menali. Rabbi Shmuel uses the word of Hechtim to teach us the Shir, as mentioned earlier. Where does he know this halacha of two and three? Nafkale, he learns it from a different um, Pasuk, Medrab Simoi. The Tanya of Simoi Oimer, there are actually two Psukim. There's the aforementioned Pasuk, and then there's an additional Pasuk which goes as follows. Ish ish ki ye zav, That Pasuk mentions the words ziva twice, and that is the Pasuk for a zav that sees twice. The aforementioned Pasuk, when she mentions the word ziva three times, comes to teach us the zav bal gimariyos. Again, let's see inside the Tanya of Simoy Oyma Mona Kosov Shtayim. The Torah counts twice the Kari Tame and considers him Tame. That is the latter pasuk which only has the word ziva twice. Shalish, there is another pasuk which contains ziva three times. The Kari Tame Torah constitutes that to be Tuma Ziva Haketzad. Shtayim la Tuma. How do we reconcile both psukim? Is it two or is it three? The answer is two will give him tumah. Three, however, will add an obligation to bring a carbon.
According to the Chachamim, who derive both types of Zav from the longer Pasuk, the Zav Baal Shteiriyos and the Zav Baal Gimariyos are both learned from the same Pasuk. So what are they going to do with the short Pasuk of Rab Simoy? Ish ish ki yi azav mipsarai mai overlay. What do they do with that pasuk? What do they use it for? Mibayle, they needed achet yeitzi mipsarai. It's coming to teach you. Ki yi azav mipsarai, that the ziva needs to leave the guf to be metamehim. Zoi vay tomei lomahi, the latter pasuk, the pasuk which says, Zoi vay tomei, what is that coming to teach us? Limei dala zoiv shu tomei. That the actual zoiv, the zera itself, the zoiv, is actually tomei. Meaning, by coming into contact with the ziva, that itself will transmit tuma onto the negeya. So in conclusion, we have two psukim in the parasha of ziva. One pasuk mentions the word zoiv twice, and one pasuk mentions the zoiv three times. So according to Rishmol, the, the short pasuk is referring to azav bal shteiriyos, and the longer pasuk is referring to azav According to the Rabbanon, both types of Zav are contained in the longer Pasuk. And we have an extra Pasuk to teach us that the Tumah needs to leave the Guf and that the Tumah will be Matame upon contact. Both the Chachamim and Rabbi Shmuel maintain that in order for Ziva to be Matame needs to be Lach. The question is just where we're learning it from. According to the Rabbanon, we learn it from the Pasuk of Hechtim sorry, which teaches us that it needs to be something which can block, which is moist. According to Rabbi Shema, we learn that from the Pasuk, from the word Rur, that needs to be a liquid, um, have a liquid property in order to be Matami. And the, the um, only machlekes between the Rabbanon and Rabbi Shema is whether the shear of Zayv is a Mashu, according to the Rabbanon, and according to Rishmol, the shear is an amount which can block the Amma, and he derives that from the Pasuk of Hechsim Psarai Mi Zayvay. So, in conclusion, we have a Machlekes going between Rishmol and Chachamim. What is the shear of Keri or of Ziva that is a Matami person? According to Rabban, it is a Mashu, as mentioned in the Mishnah. According to Rishmol, you need a certain amount, um, enough which can block the opening of the Amma. If a person discharges Caesar Bemashu, he's following the sheet of the Rabbanon. however, by coming into contact with the Zara, what is the shear to a time a person? Bika Adasha, the size of Adasha, which is a lentil. The Mishnah says that these things are Matame even with a mashu. My love, Lunaigea, we're not speaking about even by coming into contact with them. Loy Luraya, the mission is speaking about Raya, seeing them, discharging them. Over there, there's a din of Mashu. He is talking about coming into contact. Coming into contact with a Dover tummy requires a shear. And since we're going to derive that from the halacha of coming into contact with a Zara, is derived from the halacha of Tumas Sheretz. Therefore, a certain minimal shear is required similar to the shear of Sheretz, which is a Kadasha. So, Dr. Gemara, Toshma, come in here. There is a Chumrah, there is a stringency that Shechva Zera has over Tumas Sheretz. And the same in the reverse. Sheretz carries with it a Chumrah over Shechva Zera. What is that? The Chumrah of Sheretz is the following, There is no distinction by a Sheretz within different stages and different categories. We'll see soon, the Gemara will explain what that means. By Shechvazera, however, we find Chiluk, we find distinctions. That is the first part of the Bryce. What is the Chumra that Shechvazera has over um, Sheretz? Shechvazera is Metame, even with a minute amount. For Sheretz to be Matama, you need to have a Shir Kadasha. So we find a Chumrah that Sheikh Bazar has over Sheretz. That is the words, those are the words of the Brisa. So Gemara is going to explore. My love, well, we just said that Sheikh Bazar is Matama Bechoshu. Are we not speaking about Lenai Geya? 
since the Bryce is discussing Tumas Maga, Asheretz is only about Tama Maga. So evidently that is the context of the Bryce. So when the Bryce goes and says that Asheretz has a shear and Zera does not have a shear, evidently we're speaking about which Tuma? Tumas Maga of Zera. And the Bryce states very clearly that there's a shear of Adasha. So that doesn't fit well with the memory with the halacha of Reb Chaniloi. So to Yomar Eloi, we're not talking about coming into contact. We're talking about Tumas Roya. We're talking about discharging, seeing the Zerah. In that case, there's no discussion. Of course, even a Mashu is sufficient. In fact, how does that fit with the words of the Brayasa? V'hadumi the Sheretz Ketani. Here, look, the Brayasa is coming to compare the Tumah of Sheretz to the Tumah of Shechvah's Zerah. And the Brayasa is saying that Sheretz has a leniency that we require a shear of Adosha. That's something that Shechvah's Zerah does not have. So evidently, the discussion is regarding Tumas Maga. And the Brayasa says that in order for Zerah to be metame be Maga, a Mashu is enough. And you don't need a Shir Kadasha. Again inside, Vodumi the Sheretz Ketani. Ma Sheretz Benegia. A Sheikh Vazera Benegia. So that won't fit well with the memory of Rabbi Chaniloi. Amar Vada Barava Shum Sheretz Ketani. Vishum Sheikh Vazera Ketani. It's true. We're not discussing a specific case in the Bryce. The Bryce is merely comparing the categories. In the category of Sheretz, we find a din of a Shir of Adosha. And in the ca- category of Zerah, however, we find that it has the kayak, the potential, to be a matami, even with a mashu. So true. Strictly regarding Maga, they're both equated. Sheikh Zerah needs Adosha, and so too does Sheretz. However, in the overall category of Sheikh Zerah, we do find a specific halacha, which does not require more than a mashu. So in that case, Zerah has a stringency over Sheretz. So it does make sense to compare the two things because we're going and equating the categories. In the Sheretz we don't find this Chumrah of Amashu that we find by Zerah. So this does fit well with Rav Chaniloi. True that for in order to be Matami Bemaga, Zerah is required to be a share of Kadasha. But the Braisa, when the Braisa says that Zerah has a din of Amashu that is referring to Tumas Re'ia of Zerah. How could you say the sheretz like matam be mashu? How could you say a sheretz is not be matam even with a mashu? When there is a limb, an aver of a davar tami, even if it's a small, teeny amount, regardless of its size, it is matami. For instance, pachas mikazayis b'sarameis. You have a piece of a, of a dead person that is less than a shir kazayis, or parches mikazayis barson revela, or parches mikadoshem and asheretz. So we find that even a sheretz will be matame with a small amount. So how does that fit with the brayso which stated that a sheretz needs to have a shir kadosha? And for the gemara, shani aver, a limb is different. It is so significant that the significance is equated with a shir. It is so chashiv that it doesn't need a shir. True, ordinarily, you need a share. You need a, a basar mace needs to be a kazai. Same thing with an avela, same thing with a share. It's in your adasha. Except where it's an aver, it's a limb on its own, then it has a chashivas of a shear. Again, inside, shani aver. Aver is different. The kulei, being that you have a complete aver, the makim adasha koi, it is in the place of a shear adasha. What is the raya? The ilu for, for For instance, let's say the aver is missing a little bit. Mika matamya? Will it then be matami? Of course not. So you see from there that the kayach of Eva, the power of an Eva is only because it is whole. It is, that gives it significance to compensate for the lack of shear. Now the Gemara is going to go back and interpret the next part of the Brisa that we mentioned earlier. So the Gemara is Shechva Zera de Chaluka Tomase Mai. The Gemara, the Brisa said that Sheretz has no distinctions. Sheikh Vazera does have distinctions. What do we find? What are we talking about? What kind of distinctions are we speaking about? Mahi, Ilayma ben Yisrael the Nachrim, that in Zera we find a chiluk, we find differentiation between the Zera of Yisrael, which is Matami. However, the Zera of Agai is not Matami. So that is unique to Zera. That is something we don't find by Sheretz. We don't find chilukim by Sheretz? Hachinami here to Ika, Achbar a mouse 
of the Yam, of the ocean, of the Yabasha. Only the Akhbar, the mouse of the Yabasha is Matama. So we found a chilik in sherets between one type of sherets and another type of sherets. So it is similar to Zera, we find distinctions and we find chilukim. Ela ben katan the gado. The, the um, halacha that the Bryce mentioned, that in Zera we find differences, that is an age difference. We're referring to a difference between age groups that are katan, Rashi says a katan less than nine years and a day. His Zera is not matami doesn't possess any tumor, as does the zera of a gadol. However, by shratzim, we don't find the difference of age group. A sheretz and matame, even if he's one day old, regardless of his age. So that explains the b'risa in its totality. The b'risa had said, there's a chumra of zera over sheretz, because in zera, there is tumas kolshu, so either it's referring to tumas re'iya, or even tumas maga, depending which shita you're following. According to Rabbi Chan Eloi, the Bryce is only referring to Tumas Ria because Tumas Maga does require Shir Kadasha. And Sheretz certainly requires a Shir Kadasha, so there is a stringency over Sheretz. The next part of the Bryce, actually, which was the initial opening statement of the Bryce, that there is a difference between Zera and Sheretz, that um, in Zera we find differences of age groups. Meaning that a, a, share, a zera of a cotton is not matame as is the zera of a cotton. However, by Shratzim we don't find that chiluk, and that gives us a stringency that zera has over, um, that that uh, sheretz has over zera. So we have a chiluk, we have a stringency of zera over sheretz, which is the tumamashu, and in the reverse as well, there's a chumra to sheretz over zera that in sheretz it is tummy regardless of its age. Amr Rav Papa, Kitanoi, the halacha of Rav Chaniloi, that Tumas Maga of Zera requires a Shir Kadasha, it would seem to be that as Machleik is Tanoi. How is that? It says in the Brayse, Minayin Lurabis Negev Shich Vazera. How do we know that a person who comes into contact with Zera is Tami? Tami Loima Oyish. It's an extra pasuk to be Marba even a Negev of Zera. Now, twice and twice we have the Ribuy of Oyish. We have it in the Parsha of Zera. In the Pasuk, speaking about Zerah, there is an extra word, Oyish, which can perhaps be Marbe coming into contact with the Zerah. And as well, in the parish of Sheretz, Negev Sheretz, the Torah uses the words Oyish, and perhaps that is coming to be Marbe, Negea, Bezera as well. So the question is, which one are we referring to? It seems to be, according to Rav Papa, that the Riboy will be coming from the parsha from the Pasuk of Sheretz. So now the question is as follows. When we learn, we derive Zerah, the Tumah of Negiyah Bezerah, from the, the Halacha of Negiyah Besheretz. Just as Negiyah Besheretz is Matami, so to Negiyah Bezerah. Now, let's ask a question. Do we derive it completely from there? A, that it can be Matami through Negiyah. Number two, the Shear as well will be similar to the Shear of Sheretz, which is Kadasha. Or perhaps we say, what well, we need to learn from there, we do. The fact that the concept that there exists a Tumas Maga by Negeab Zerah. However, regarding the Shir, perhaps we'll come back home, we'll come back and take it back into the context of Zera, which has possesses the power to be Matami Bekolshu. A person's Roya Zerah, all he needs is a Kolshu. So that will be dependent on a general Machlekes, which we find many times in Shas. When we derive A from B, is it derived completely? Do we derive and continue to derive everything from the source? Or do we take what we need and come back home? Let's see inside. Opligi tanoi ba'alma. We have a general machlegis tanoim. The ikadamri, some say, dun mina, we derive it from there. Umina, we continue to derive it. So in our case, we will derive everything from sheretz. Um, a, the fact that it can be matami, and in addition, that there's a shear of kadosha. Just like Sheretz. Ikadamri, some say no. Do we know we derive something from a source? Vulki Basra, we will come back to its original context. So, therefore, in our case, we will come back to the context which is Zera, which carries with it a stringency of a Tuma, the Mashu. So, even though we're speaking about Tuma Samaga, which we derive from Sheretz, however, regarding the Shir, how much is required, a Mashu will be sufficient.
Let's see inside. Lamanda Amar Dun Mino Mino. According to the Shita, we derive and continue to derive. Ma Sheretz Benegia, just like Sheretz is Matami Bemaga Afshech Vazera Benegia Umino, and therefore we continue to derive from there. Ma Sheretz Bekadasha, you need a Shir Kadasha. Afshech Vazera Kadasha. So too by Zera, you need a Shir of a lentil. So that is one approach. The other Shita will hold. Ulamanda Amar Dun Mino. We study from there, we derive from there. Uki Basra, we come back to its original place. Which would mean that in this case we learn the concept of Tumah from Sheretz. However, regarding the shear that is required, for that we will go back home to the parish of Zerah, which has in it a shear of Mashu. Ma Sheretz benegia, Afshich Azerah benegia. Bu'ugi Basra, we will place it back into its context. Ma Sheikh Azerah, Leroya Mashu. Just like we find by Sheikh Azerah, the halacha of Roya Mashu. Same thing, we'll equate the halacha of contacting the Sheikh Azerah, which will be Dafka. So again, going back to the um, beginning of this last tikkun gemara of Chaneloi was mechadish that negia zera requires a kadasha. Rava proposed it as machlekes tanoim. Since we are st- we are deriving from sheretz, the question is: Do we derive just the concept? However, the shear will be a mashu, or we derive everything from there? And the shear as well needs to be similar to the shear of sheretz, which is kadasha. One more final piece of Gemara. Amalei Afuna Beder Rav Nasser Papa. No, I disagree with this. How do we know? How do you know that the riboy that we're including the halach of Negia Bezera from the Oy Ish, which is quoted in the sugya and the parsha and the pasuk of Sheretz, and thereby you built a whole um, subsequent binyan, a whole shtigl Torah to explain the machlekes Tanaim, and you you made you. Um, you connected this to the general machlekes of Dumina, Dumasra, etc. How do we know that? Perhaps the derivation is from the Oyish, which is said in the Pasha of Zera, right here. In the Pasha of Zera, the Torah says the word Oyish, which is coming to your marba, not just Roya, Zera, but even coming into contact with Zera, and therefore is not connected, is not related to any machlekes of Dumina, Vuki Basra, etc. Of course, the Pasik, which is said by Zera, and includes contact, Nagiya Bazera, is referring to the Shir Mashu, just like Riya Zera. Plain and simple. How do you know to derive it from the word Ayish, which is mentioned in the Parsha of Sheretz? We're deriving it from the word Ayish, which is said in the Pasuk of Zera. Everybody will hold. According to everybody in this case, we will derive it completely from Zera, from the halacha of Zera, which means only a mashu. So which way do we go? Is it from Ayish of Sheretz, or is it from Ayish of Zera? The Nafkamina is, if we're deriving from Sheretz, perhaps there is a room for Machlekes Tanaim on the Shir, whether we equate it completely Sheretz, which is Kadash, or we bring it back home and we apply the halacha of mashu, or do we derive it from the word Ayish that is um, mentioned in the parsha of Zera, and s- s- simply put, it has the same halacha of Riya Zera, which is a mashu. So Shailinu Tanoi, they asked the Amiraim who would study the, uh, who uh, were, uh, were proficient with the Brises, Ika the Tanik Rapapa, some had um, Learned like Rav Papa, because the Tanik Rav Huna Rav Rav Nason, some had uh, taken on the approach of Rav Huna Rav Rav Nason, and there is no machlekes in this case, since we are deriving it locally from the parsha of Zera, and therefore certainly the shear is the same as Riya, which is a mashu, and is unrelated to the general machlekes of Dun Mino of Ilke Basra or Dun Mino Mino, since it is halacha which is local, strictly by Zerah.